So welcome to our session on data towards proactive and resilient communities. So before we begin, again, please make sure that your microphone is muted. And please do take part in the discussion by sharing your comments or questions in the chat box as well. So again, I am Chris Libunao, Executive Director and Chief Sustainability Officer of Smart City, and I will be moderating this session. So the session will last like around one hour. So again, very welcome to all and thanks again for joining us. So COVID made us realize that, you know, cities and communities are on the front line of any like pandemic and disasters. In Southeast Asia, such challenges include rising sea levels, destructive, you know, typhoon seasons, amongst others. On top of this, COVID made us also realize that data, in particular, open data and digital transformation can indeed offer the opportunity to support cities in becoming more resilient, becoming more green and inclusive towards their citizens. So today we are very, very delighted that we have the forerunners in digital transformation and smart, resilient local planning and governance in Asia. So Kalum Hanforth, um, advisor of digitalization and um, smart cities of UNDP Global Center for Technology and Innovation. We have here Engineer o, um, Ariel Oiglesia as well, Regional Director of Department of Interior and Local Government, um, Region 4A of the Philippines. And we, Dr. Jong Sung Wang just joined us as well, Master Planner of Busan Smart City and South Korea. So you would see that everyone here is, you know, in for a treat. So let us listen to the aspirations and achievements of our esteemed guests. So. Kalum, would you mind starting, you know, the ball rolling and introduce yourself and your organization? Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Callum. I lead the digitalization and smart cities team at the UNDP Global Center for Tech, Innovation and Sustainable Development. Should I share my screen? Perfect. Hopefully you can see my slides. Fantastic. So thank you all again for the opportunity. Um, what I'm going to do here is just walk through um, a lot of work that UNDP and, and other partners in the development sector are seeing in the context of using data to improve how cities work, function, and fundamentally how they improve uh, citizens' lives as well. To start with, though, um, I'd just like to start with the notion of, of what is a smart city. Um, so we throw this term around quite a bit, and this is a quick Google search from the other day. Um, if you search for smart city, you get pages after pages of big data, 5G, um, and so on. What we're trying to do at UNDP is actually try to redefine what smart city means. So it's not just about technology, but technology and innovation. And that innovation includes aspects like nature-based solutions, uh, local and indigenous knowledge, uh, behavior change, good urban planning, and so on. Um, obviously, technology, data, and so on play a really fundamental role in that. Um, but we really see that any city can be a smart city, not just those that are focusing on high tech. With that in mind, um, I'd like to walk through a few uses of data in that context. Um, the first, as Chris mentioned, is very much in the context of COVID-19. So last year, we saw a huge shift in urban design, urban planning, um, often at significant pace um, due to things like uh, shifts in remote working, uh, remote living, uh, people uh, staying, uh, students not being able to study in uh, education institutions, and so on. So when we talk about using data in a city, it's also about governance um, being responsive enough to use that data to inform quick policy and other decisions as well. So one example is what we call tactical urbanism. So quickly redesigning uh, city streets, urban landscapes, um, using data, using citizen perspectives, and so on. The second as well is often we talk about big data. Um, and one example is our, our Pintig lab um, in the Philippines, which is doing some really exciting work uh, leveraging epidemiological um, and other big data sources. But we also need to be talking about lean data. Um, our friends at 60 Decibels are doing some great work here. So lean data is um, firstly taking a more portfolio approach to using data. So not just one data point, but looking at numerous interventions. But it's also about the stories and the lives behind each data point. So instead of just focusing on the aggregate, it's about speaking to people, learning about their lives, and using data sources, whether mobile data, 
uh, calling people up, um, SMS or others, where we can actually engage on a very one-to-one -one micro level to understand how people are living and the kind of cities that they need. Related to that as well as making smart cities and data real for citizens. Often when we talk about the smart city, it's in the abstract. And when we talk to citizens, they don't always recognize the potential that a smart city can mean for their lives and their livelihoods. Um, our friends at uh, Digital Transparency in the Public Realm, which is a kind of spin out from Sidewalk Labs, um, have got a really exciting open source project here where um, for every single use of data in a smart city, for example, it might be CCTV, it might be a traffic sensor, um, there's an associated taxonomy and QR code behind that. So if you're a citizen standing um, at a light waiting for the, the traffic to stop for you, to, for you to, uh, to cross the road, you'll see a QR code that you can scan to learn more about what that sensor is doing, where the data is being used, who's using it, uh, the kind of data being collected, and so on. And again, it's about making smart cities real for citizens and making them understand the kind of potential and role that they play in their day-to-day -day lives. On that, though, we need to really focus on the importance of what we call feedback loops. So if we're collecting data or we're getting data from citizens or using them in a city, um, we need to make sure that citizens understand the potential and the role and the importance of that data. This is a project I worked on before joining UNDP, where we ran a interactive radio project for several weeks. Um, and citizens would phone up with the answers to questions that they would like to have um, answers live on, on the air the following week. The issue we had though is that this became much more successful than we, than we thought possible. So every week we would have to uh, download, code, translate, um, and then sort more than a thousand different questions. Um, and thankfully the project only lasted five weeks so we could sustain this. But if it lasted any longer, it wouldn't have been possible. So with something like data collection and data usage, we need to make sure that any kind of feedback loop is honest and that we can actually deliver the experience that citizens want, expect, and that they deserve as well. And then finally, just to wrap up, um, is the importance of inclusivity. When we talk about data, again, often we see it as quite a homogenous and inclusive concept. But when we start digging down into the detail of data, um, often we see there are kind of very real risks and issues, particularly when we use it to inform policymaking and decision making. So this is some analysis from our friends at UNICEF. Um, the charts on the left, the, the maps, highlight that actually when we talk about mobile data, so data from smartphones and others, um, which we often use in the urban environment, often the ownership of mobile phones is hugely um, varied across society. In particular, women excluded from mobile ownership, poor people, and so on. So if you're relying on just mobile data um, to inform policymaking, there's a very real risk that you create the policies that don't work or actively uh, exclude or entrench divides in society as well. And then finally, the chart on the right highlights the importance of digging into detail and not focusing on the aggregate. If you, this again is, is mobile data looking at how COVID-19 changed mobility patterns in Indonesia. If we looked at the average, that red line, we'd see that actually mobility patterns dropped quite significantly. But then if you um, disaggregate that by uh, income levels, we see that actually those who are more privileged in society have more control over when they can work from home, when they can travel and so on. So again, if we're using this data to inform how we design cities or how we design policies, um, we're running real risks of ignoring the most salient details just by focusing on the average and the high level. So thank you all for your time and thank you, Chris, for the opportunity. Thank you, Caleb. Um, it's very interesting to see the, your, your initiatives in terms of redefining smart city initiatives and how can we really operationalize it from the ground. Um, so thanks again, Kelum, and we really look forward to hearing more insights from your experience in UNDP. So without further ado, I will hand it over to engineer Ariel O. Iglesia to share his passion for good local governance and um, financial accountability and ethical leadership in public service. Engineer Iglesia. Yes, thank you very much, Ms. Chris. Allow me to share my presentation. Thank you very much, Ms. Chris, and uh, thank you too to Smart City for inviting us in this uh, forum. Uh, this is a good opportunity for us to share some of the things that uh, we're doing as one of the departments in the Philippine bureaucracy as far as disaster risk reduction management is concerned. So, as you know, uh, the Department of the Interior and Local Government takes an active role in climate change adaptation 
and disaster risk reduction management. This is our mandate, pursuant uh, to Republic Act 9729 or the Climate Change Act, and Republic Act 10121 or the Disaster Risk and Reduction Management Act to provide for capacity development programs for climate change adaptation and disaster preparedness. Our efforts uh, lean towards enhancing the capacity of local government units to be at the forefront of the government's initiative to adapt, mitigate, and prepare for climate change and disasters. The department has a three component framework to achieve uh, climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction management compliant and local government units leading to more resilient and safe communities. The cycle framework includes assessment, capacity enhancement, and enabling access to financing to achieve adaptive and res disaster resilient local government units. The figure uh, shows us that uh, DILG, uh, CCA, DRRM intervention framework, the component on assessment tells us whether or not our local government units are institutionally prepared, what are the gaps into becoming resilient. Meanwhile, capacity enhancement aims to share knowledge, promote tools and methodologies in mainstreaming to comprehensive land use plans and comprehensive development plans, and develop capabilities of local government units and communities to be safe and resilient. Finally, the component on enabling access to financing shall provide avenues for resource generation and project development for the various CCA DRRM initiatives to materialize. Operation List on the other hand, is an advocacy program of the department which aims to strengthen disaster preparedness of local government units using the whole of government approach. Its first component called Listong Pamahalaang Lokal was launched in 2014, which institutionalized local protocols for disaster preparedness response and monitoring. Each preparedness actions listed in the operation list to manuals for hydrometeorological hazards, namely, number one, checklist of critical preparations for municipal mayors, number two, checklist of early preparations for mayors, and number three, checklist for municipal local government operations officers, chiefs of police, and fire marshals. Currently, the DILG, in partnership with the Local Government Academy, the Philippine Volcanology and Seismology, and the Batangas State University has a project to develop a list of manual which is specific to volcanic uh, eruptions. This is now the community-based community monitoring system which is an organized process of data collection and processing at the local level, and integration of data in local planning, program implementation, and impact monitoring. It is a system that promotes evidence-based policy, policy making and program implementation while empowering communities to participate in the process. It was developed in the early 1990s under the micro impacts of macroeconomic adjustment policies project in the Philippines to provide policymakers and program implementers with a good information base for tracking the impacts of macroeconomic reforms in various policy shocks. Further development of the CBMS methodology, instruments, and training modules are being spearheaded or implemented by the CBMS International Co Network Coordinating Team, or NICT. In Region 4A alone, 77 local government units have already implemented the program. With a positive uh, impact of CBMS to the local government units as expressed by the LGUs during the annual CBMS National Conference, led to the passing of Republic Act 11315, more commonly known as the CBMS Act in 2019. 
This is a solid proof of the recognition by the national governments of the impact that it brings in poverty alleviation through evidence-based planning. So I think uh, that would be all and uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for that, Engineer Iglesia. I am sure everyone here is, is as excited as I am um, to hearing your regional, ex regional perspective insights on digital transformation and resiliency planning in the Philippines. So now, last but not the least, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Jong Song Wang to give us an, an overview of his rich experience in terms of digital transformation and smart city planning and development in South Korea. So Jong Sung, um, thank you for joining us again. Yes, so, uh, so I'm going to, I'd like to focus on uh, the platform interoperability. So, uh, today, our topic is how to strengthen uh, resilience using uh, data. Uh -huh. So, uh, it is, I'd like to stress the role of uh, platform, interoperability, platform interoperability, and I'd like to, I, I'm going to explain what we are doing uh, in Korea uh, for uh, such platform interoperability. So, first, we need to, we need to know uh, the, the structure of uh, data, the role of data in a uh, smart city. So first, uh, we need to decouple, decouple smart city from solution. So in many smart city approaches, uh, it is common to combine smart city with a solution. Uh, but uh, in essence, a smart city uh, um, should be decoupled, decoupled from, from uh, so solutions, just like a smartphone. Smartphone uh, is decoupled from uh, apps, so it's just like the relationship is the same uh, this, uh, with uh, in uh, so smartphone. So, uh, if we decouple uh, solutions, the role of smart city is to uh, is to work as a kind of a platform. So, which is, which is so integrate. Uh, data sensor and devices and uh, which enable uh, various users to access to such data sensor and devices. So uh, platform interoper interoperability is the essence of any uh, smart, uh, smart city initiatives. Also, uh, when we have this kind of uh, platform interoperability, we can increase our ability to uh, cope with any crisis like uh, so COVID-19. So there are many methods, several methods for uh, platform interoperability. The traditional one is use, is to use API. So we can connect different uh, platform using API. Another one is uh, to develop a common platform. So uh, is to con by constructing a common platform, different platforms can share their, da their data and their devices. But uh, the uh, traditional way, traditional methods have many uh, limitations. Uh, on, uh, among uh, among others, so uh, they are very uh, so platform should be developed every time uh, when it needs to connect another new uh, platforms. So uh, what we are now trying to build is uh, platform or platform platform or platforms type of approaches. So we call them meta meta platform approaches. So we. Uh, we set up a uh, standardized, we sh uh, shared meta platform, then uh, any platforms just can be connected by, uh, so, uh, by so, how to say, comply with the rule of uh, this uh, meta platform. So we are now building two national pilot smart city. I'm in charge of one of them, uh, the, the one uh, in, uh, one, uh, uh, in uh, Busan. Uh, this uh, slide shows the location of uh, Busan National Pilot Smart City. So the biggest, the, 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 first, the top priority, priority strategy we are doing is, as I explained, a uh, platform of platforms approach. The goal is not just to share data. The goal is to enable us to share resources like so CCTV sensors, uh, so, so many uh, so urban facilities like elevator or electronic, electronic door, and also share even uh, digital twins. 
So the second one is to develop a new kind of data architecture, not only protect personal data, but also uh, enable us to to enable us to access balanced data. So protection is, uh, is, uh, is not enough. So we want to balance so protection and use of personal data at the same time. So uh, that's, uh, that's why we are now developing new data architecture. Third one is uh, so kind of digital uh, twin. So, but uh, we we developed a new concept, uh, so CPS, uh, new CPS concept. It is called the Cyber Physical Society. But originally, CPS stands for Cyber Physical System, but uh, Smart City is not system. So we are now developing a new uh, CPS concept, Cyber Physical Society. Finally, a robot friendly city. So uh, we think we need to uh, change. So current city structure and the city infrastructure in order to uh, use many emerging technology, including robotics and AR, VR, and there are many uh, technologies. This is my uh, last slide. So uh, our, we, after COVID-19, most, most cities want to uh, secure resilience. So how we can secure resilience? So we don't know what kind of uh, crisis we will have. So we, we can have we will we, we can have another we will have another crisis after uh, COVID nineteen we don't know what it is so uh, the best 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 thing we can do is to make uh, so platform very flexible platform then uh, then it enable it help us to uh, quickly responding to outside or unexpected crisis. So, and we uh, define smart city from such a platform or platform perspective. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Again, thank you for, for that, Dr. Jong Sung Wong. Indeed, Korea is a front runner in terms of technological advancement in the region. And I myself, coming from the Philippines, is hoping that we will reach the same technological maturity that Korea is experiencing currently. I'm sure. Um, you will share more um, later about your experience and your journey in transforming Seoul and other like cities in Korea to smart cities. So again, thank you, Jong Sung, and thank you, everyone. Just to remind you know everyone here, please feel free to share your comments and you know questions in the chat in the chat, and we will weave it in um, with other questions that we have currently. So let's move forward as you listen to all the panelists. They come from such diverse sectors with rich experiences in building resilience. So again, COVID and disasters have taught us that things can change with such a short time and they actually cause a lot of challenges um, in the way we live, in the way we work, and with the way we do business. So with this, seems like resiliency is becoming the next like kind of like a buzzword of today. That is why I want to ask the panelists today, how does building resilience fit in, in the SDG agenda and the Smart City agenda uh, itself? So um, perhaps uh, Jong Sung can start, then Kelum, then perhaps uh, Engineer Iglesia. Yes, so uh, as I explained, so the, now, so now it's, uh, it's time, I, I, after COVID-19, it's time to we transform a city. So so far, we are uh, the city. Uh, we uh, the, 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 we have uh, many innovation in cities, but uh, so far innovations mostly uh, most innovations focus on uh, improvement and uh, reformation. That means that uh, we haven't changed the system itself. So, but it's time to uh, make some kind of transformation. Uh, transform, transformation means uh, change A to B, but improvement and uh, reformation is to, cha is to uh, is change A to A dash, or uh, so something very similar to A. So the COVID-19, so uh, so far, all our innovations focus on uh, focus on making more and more people live in a, a limited space. 
that we, we call that urban innovation. So elevators, so we, we, there are many, to, so how to say, uh, transportation, many things. Most urban innovations uh, uh, the, uh, share the same goal, to make more and more people live in a limited area. But now, uh, so we should push another uh, type of uh, uh, urban innovation, as you talk about uh, SDG, and also you talk about resilience. So uh, now, from now on, uh, urban innovation should uh, focus on how to increase flexibility of city and how to increase the role of each indiv indiv individual citizens and also how to guarantee continuity of uh, city operation. So, uh, so uh, what we try to do is in Korea is to uh, incorporate such new demanding into uh, smart city initiatives and we design new concept. Uh, we call that uh, augmented city. So augmented city means that uh, sit, so now uh, so far uh, cities are adapted to city, but it's time city uh, strengthen or city augment each citizen or each organizations to, uh, to keep their continuity and to, to do better functions <laughs> in any uh, circumstances. Okay. Thank you for that. Any thoughts, uh, Engineer Iglesia? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Chris. Well, my belief is that uh, due to our geographical location, our country has always been poised to be resilient. We've had so many hard lessons learned from disasters that being uh, a Filipino almost equally means being resilient. So, but experience tells us that uh, it takes more than just one shot effort to make or develop a country that uh, into being a resilient one. We have to look at the bigger picture and strengthen our communities in all fronts. In the language of uh, disaster risk reduction and management, we need to ensure that our local government units or our communities are capable of handling prevention, mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. Our ability to bounce back is always put to the test, but it should bear the same weight as that of prevention and mitigation, which means we might, we might also have to shift our focus in plans into a disaster-proof development. So I think uh, that would be my uh, insights on that uh, particular question. Thank you. Thank you, Engineer. Kalum? Thank you, Chris. Um, so I very much agree with, with the other two speakers. Um, what I'd also like to, to reaffirm is the resilience is, highlights the importance of broadening our definition of, of what a smart city is. So resilience, as you mentioned, Chris, is not a, a single concept. It is, it's huge. It's everything about policy, process, city design, how we live our lives, our livelihoods, and so on. Um, and I think that needs to also be reflected in what we call a smart city. So one approach of a smart city for resilience is, you know, big data, IoT, uh, monitoring, you know, water flows and so on using predictive analytics, places like Singapore and others are doing that very well. Um, another model of um, resilience is what's happening a lot in, in China. So sponge cities using kind of natural environment, grasslands and so on to soak up water. Um, and then we have um, some work happening in, in Dakar, the capital of Senegal, um, where recent uh, flooding happens in the same kind of suburbs. So the kind of local community there have turned those suburbs into kind of urban farms and that's providing really valuable uh, income to the informal economy. So again, it's looking at the kind of many different uh, facets of resilience and how they can be applied using different city tools and different city designs as well. That for us is a smart city. Thank you for that. So I guess we all agree here about the importance of resilience that is like to bounce back after any like disaster or challenge. And one of the ways that is currently being used by cities and community to bounce back from the current pandemic is really digital transformation. So I guess on that note with your global experience in terms of digitization, Calum, what is the importance of data for making communities uh, resilient? So data plays a really important role. 
um, particularly in kind of informing uh, decision making, informing policy making. Um, often it's, it's the strongest evidence base we can have. Um, but we need to make sure that data collection is inclusive as well. So a lot of the communities most affected by resilience issues are those that often get excluded from, from data collection. And if you're not counted for policymaking, you don't count. So for example, if we are looking at um, tackling uh, resilience in a kind of informal sectors, informal markets and so on, um, what data sources can we use to actually ensure that we're not leaving those communities behind? That might be looking at things like mobile data, but again, the issues of, of mobile ownership for women in particular make that tricky. It may be about using proxy data sources um, and even higher tech approaches like satellite data can be really, really exciting as well. So we've seen some work where uh, satellite data is being used to, to measure poverty levels from space, looking at how high buildings are, looking at what kind of cars or motorbikes or similar are outside of properties. So again, using our data to ensure that we're not um, excluding the populations who are most affected uh, by resilience challenges. It's a very refreshing take in terms of data like collection and inclusivity um, in terms of um, not leaving anyone like behind kind of thing. So thank you for that global like perspective on this scalum. And I would like to hear the thoughts of, um, I guess, Engineer Iglesia in terms of their ex experiences in applying this on the ground in relation to, I guess, in relation to data, can you share like the barriers uh, which you have faced in your efforts to drive resilience movement during the cha this challenging times and you know perhaps disasters and how do you do you or your organizations overcome overcome them? Engineer Iglesia. Uh, I think you're on meet, Engineer Iglesia. Sorry for that. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. And uh, I think uh, one of the biggest barriers in terms of data here in the Philippines is the unavailability of updated data. Not uh, all local government units in terms of uh, our function as DILG can afford data gathering, more so update the data that they have. If there's any data available, it is more often that uh, these data are already outdated. So to overcome this, we at the department uh, promotes the implementation of uh, a certain program, uh, the community-based monitoring system for the local government units in order for them to have a readily available data once uh, it is uh, needed. Thank you. Thank you, Engineer Iglesia. How about uh, Jong Sung? Uh, is there any like challenges in terms of data collection in South Korea? Yeah, definitely, definitely. We have, you have all got countless uh, so out of barriers and problems uh, in uh, and so uh, using uh, data, uh -huh. so um, um, many uh, problems. So, but uh, the biggest challenge, yeah. so so there, there are a different different argument. But uh, the biggest challenge uh, is that uh, we don't have enough number of good services. So uh, the system is like this: so the more data, uh, the more data you have, the better service you can make, and. Uh, Conversely, the better service you have, the more and the better data you, you can produce. Huh? So the, the relationship uh, is very uh, is very close. But which one comes first? So like just like uh, so, so, so egg and chicken egg and chicken relation. Which one, which one uh, come first? Then uh, it's definitely service. So if we have good service, then we can uh, we can uh, we can have uh, better uh, data and more data. So uh, let me think about why Facebook, Google, and other global uh, service providers uh, so, uh, successfully collect so so huge amount of the data because their service is uh, so how say as, as to, uh, outstanding outstanding to other services, domestic and global. Uh, so more and more people use so, such, such a service. So uh, we, have, we have developed data uh, so far uh, during the last couple, so several, several decades, we have developed the data, so the database. But uh, so how to say supply, supply side have any way uh, limitation. Uh, there's some point we can overcome with so uh, creating data strategy. So uh, the breakthrough 
uh, can come from uh, so uh, making innovative service uh, in government or in business or in social life. So, uh, so one of our project is to uh, develop uh, so intelligent government. So uh, make a government use data analytics in um, in more wide wide range of uh, policy making. Also, uh, the government depends on uh, AI, you uh, AI technology in their service delivery. Anything. So uh, we believe that uh, such approach or well, breakthrough in service can uh, can how to say can uh, provide so new new opportunity uh, for, uh, for to us in using uh, in, in using uh, data uh, data collecting data and then use data so thank you thank you for that so we really are in such you know trying times and such calls perhaps um, all the panelists like can agree that such calls for all hands on deck so how relevant since Jong Sung already mentioned earlier the, the collaboration between the businesses, the government in terms of data collection. How relevant is it for the governments, the develop organiza de development organizations and businesses to bring all the available data together? Um, perhaps uh, Caleb can start. Sure. Thanks, Chris. Um, so I think it's, it's very important that obviously public private partnerships and others are, are play a really central role here. Um, the two elements that I'd, I'd really like to flag. Um, the first is um, the kind of role and the responsibilities of both of those sectors. So, for example, we work with many governments who don't want to design apps. In fact, instead, they want to build open data structures to then kind of catalyze the private sector to build those apps in, instead. So trying to find the, the balance between what each sector does, roles and responsibilities is, is really important. Um, the second element, and this is more my perspective than, than a UN viewpoint, um, is some of the kind of risks of um, private sector service delivery. So um, often the private sector, as, as um, Yong Sung mentioned, um, has phenomenal services and also has legitimacy and reach that government in some countries could never get. So you can go to some uh, very rural places where it'll be Facebook, but there won't be any government presence. But the issue with that though is that that data is obviously then owned by a private entity. And if we're trying to build better services, um, learn what works and what doesn't, it's very, very hard to kind of replicate best practice. So I've worked on a number of projects where the data, um, we have to sign NDAs to run projects and programs. And that means then, you know, academics or others trying to build similar programs cannot see the successes we've had or the challenges that we've had. So it could make the same mistakes or could even not even have the same successes. So I think we need to be thinking about what ownership of data looks like and how we can structure that so that um, there's kind of replicability, the scale and the sustainability of this as well, whilst obviously protecting people's privacy uh, as well. That's very interesting um, take on that as well. So Jong Sung, any particular take on the importance of collaboration from government development organizations and private sectors as well? Uh, yes, so uh, that is quite uh, quite critical uh, to uh, make the collab collaboration uh, relationship between all stakeholders, all stakeholders. So uh, not only a business but our citizen. Also, city, uh, we need to change the mindset mindset of citizen. Citizen knows uh, should know uh, the what is privacy issues. So what protect them? Hmm? How how to uh, protect themselves? So, but at the same time, uh, citizens also need to know the value of uh, data usage. Yeah? So, 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 and right and uh, so productive use of data, uh, it can increase the public, uh, public, how to say, interest. Uh, in in a society, so uh, we need to very active citizens uh, cit citizen role uh, in uh, so how to say developing data model and also uh, for private companies. Uh, so we are focusing on so inter intermediary uh, intermediary players. So uh, on the one hand, there's data or the, the, the companies own own huge data. That on the other side, there's a, a demand a company to want to use that data. But in Korea, uh, what we are missing now is the intermediary intermediary uh, functions. So uh, we are now so how to say there's some policies, for instance, so. 
how to say, uh, so we provide, uh, we support companies to, uh, to buy, so buy, so uh, the data, data company uh, to uh, to buy data company services so that we provide uh, financial government provide the financial incentive uh, to companies to use more and more uh, the data industry uh, in their uh, so how to say in their uh, the data data use so kind of inter so we think intermediary uh, uh, intermediary industries industry can uh, play a big role uh, in uh, developing uh, so the whole the national uh, uh, so how to say data ecosystem. Thank you. Thanks for that, um, Jong Sung. Any thoughts, uh, Engineer Iglesia? Yes, Chris, uh, that's very relevant. And uh, the coordination of these institutions and organizations, meaning uh, the government and all those development organizations, is the key role in harnessing credible data, meaning. Uh, uh, data sharing is very important in all aspects of uh, uh, these things. And uh, as statistics implies, uh, the more the data that we have, uh, the lesser the error. So I think uh, that's uh, the relevance of that. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Engineer Iglesia. Thank you, Callum, and thank you, Jong Sung. Indeed, uh, you know, there's a lot of actors and stakeholders in terms of data collection, and there's a lot of challenges and um, issues that we need to dealt with, like data sharing, data privacy, and of course, data literacy um, um, with regards to citizens as well. So, again, this pandemic is indeed, you know, a stark wake up call on humanity's vulnerability at all, you know, facets of life. I guess, um, Caleb, what are your experience in terms of finding, you know, data collection and sharing solutions for the partner countries in UNDP? Um, do you mind uh, expanding on the question slightly? Just... Yeah, can you give like any like experiences in terms of finding, you know, finding solutions on the ground in terms of data collection and sharing as well um, from partner countries in UNDP? Of course, yeah. So um, I think, again, it's about understanding what data collection methods are most valuable. Um, so before, um, for example, if you're looking at very kind of last mile communities, and Chris, you made a great point as well, that uh, data literacy, but also digital literacy, functional literacy as well, um, some people may not be engaged in the digital world. So if you're collecting data on populations like that, you're looking at face-to-face uh, -face surveys, you're looking at call centers and, and so on. So again, making sure your data collection efforts are inclusive. Um, I think the other opportunity when you look at digital data methods, and we see this a lot in countries in the region here, um, is the sheer potential that digital allows you to design better services. So, for example, you can run uh, things like randomized control trials or A-B tests um, on large-scale digital data, changing services uh, very quickly to improve um, how they meet the needs and realities of citizens. But again, those are very much uh, a privilege for countries with uh, digital infrastructure, uh, inclusive data um, and so on. So it's very much about trying to balance uh, the needs and the realities of the population with the tools you have available um, as well. I guess indeed I agree with you that we need like a tailor fit approach in terms of data collect data collection and you know sharing solution in terms of different countries. Thanks for that. that. Um, thanks for that, Callum. So. As a regional director, I'm curious, um, as a regional director of a national government agency handling hundreds or even thousands of communities in the Philippines, can you share some of the efforts in the Philippines that um, have, take, have taken in order to enhance data-driven data policy making for making the local governments more resilient? Um, Engineer Iglesia? Yes, thank you, Chris. Uh, I mentioned earlier the, about community-based monitoring system. And uh, the department have been promoting that uh, the implementation of that uh, CBMS or the community-based monitoring system since early 2000. This is in partnership with the community-based monitoring system network team. And we have trained our field officers to help the local government units to be familiar with the four modules uh, of that uh, said program. This includes data gathering, data processing, barangay development planning, and comprehensive development planning. 
as you can see, the last two modules of the CBMS is about planning. The results of the census are used in the evidence-based planning down to the barangay level or the village level. The tool is very useful since the data is really taken from, from household level and no one is expected to be left behind. CBMS also has data on health and nutrition, housing and sanitation, education, income, employment, and peace and order. And this data is commonly known as the core local poverty indicators. With this, our uh, local government un units can easily see the multidimensionality of poverty present in their localities. The CBMS Composite Index, uh, this is another data generated from the CBMS, shows the number of unmet needs uh, of each household. Meaning this data can be the basis of policymakers in identifying what is really needed on the ground. CBMS also provides information about the achievements of the Sustainable Development Goals as proof. As proof of this, uh, 39 out of uh, 155 Philippine SDG indicators can be found in the CBMS and uh, some of the climate change related indicators. And since CBMS provides disaggregated data, it is also recognized as a database for gender and development planning. Also, uh, the Disaster Risk and Reduction Management Officer may also use the data from the CBMS in identifying all those vulnerable groups present since CBMS also provides the household locations that can be plotted uh, in a map using uh, GIS technology. The tools are already present and uh, the challenge now is how the policy makers, which mandates the Philippine Statistics Authority, uh, who, who use the tools in decision making. Also, with the passage of the law, the CBMS also, uh, the CBMS law, way back in 2019, it mandates the Philippine Statistics Authority to be the main implementer. The national agency should work hand in hand to continuously advocate for this. Because this is a big, uh, this uh, this has a big data. It, it can be utilized in policy making. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Engineer Iglesia. So seems like COVID nineteen has shown the ability of people and communities to adapt in such extraordinary circumstances and in crisis so uh, situation. And we all know that cities, as mentioned earlier, cities and communities are at the forefront of any particular disasters that come. So as master planner and being involved in you know, planning smart cities, can you share your experience about using quant qualitative or perhaps quantitative data for studying and planning indoor and outdoor built environments, uh, Dr. Jongso? Uh, yes, so so uh, data data can contribute to city uh, in many respect in many respects so uh, seoul so i was a cio of seoul uh, some years ago so uh, so seoul has built very uh, wonderful uh, basis for uh, data sharing so it is kind of back office work. So uh, it took several years. So uh, uh, it is my impression at the moment that now uh, many government and many projects focus on front service, but uh, in, in order to use data so efficiently and effectively, uh, we need to uh, focus more on uh, back office, so how to say uh, back office and the standard. Uh, so it, it, take, it took a long time Actually, it takes a long time, but uh, the, uh, the impact is great. So uh, once we, once, uh, in Seoul, once we so, uh, develop the, uh, data, uh, the, the basis for uh, data use in uh, city operation and the city service, that, so after that, uh, it reduced the cost and risk of many, many, many projects. So uh, we can introduce new service uh, without a big, a big additional investment because we have a very nice data sharing infrastructure. So, uh, so, so I think if you come to Seoul, not just to look at the front service, you, I uh, rec strongly recommend you to visit the 
back office and how we manage the data how to we collect and how to we so uh, so how to say uh, check the quality of each data and how to distribute the data mm -hmm. so uh, so i think uh, the data can uh, can improve the city uh, operation in many respect in many many respect also uh, citizens will get big benefit Big, big benefit from uh, data. So, so I uh, I talked about uh, our vision of uh, augmented city. So, uh, a smart city has helped the city to work better, but not citizen. Uh, so, citizen uh, received uh, the 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 benefit of uh, smart city indirectly. Yeah? So uh, first the city become better, then uh, citizen uh, receive the benefit from the, 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 the citizen, uh, the, the city. Mm -hmm. But so we think it's time uh, to give a more direct benefit to citizens. So, so now uh, data, so for, for instance, health, uh, smart health also uh, we have uh, aging people aging population many aging populations so in such cases uh, we can help them to uh, live safely and live so he live healthy so using our data so for instance uh, for dementia dementia uh, dementia people uh, we provide so how to say location service so uh, some dementia people so go out of home and then they get lost uh, and the family try to find uh, find them but uh, so we have uh, some nice nice data uh, sharing systems so we can uh, we can uh, share uh, cctv uh, footage uh, footage data to locate such uh, so people uh, needed the government support then uh, so it's time to use data uh, for the citizens' uh, better living uh, of quality, better uh, living of quality. So, okay, thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Jong Sung, for the open invitation for us to visit Seoul. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Anyhow, so thank you for that. Uh, I like that you highlight the importance of the back end um, in terms of uh, building smart city and building resiliency. Because um, for us, like any for any citizens, we only see the front end and we see that apps are sexier and all. But um, thanks for highlighting that, you know, the back end and the standards and the data sharing agreement is, you know, is the foundation of building any building resiliency and building smart city in particular. So thanks for that. Uh, so moving on. So you've mentioned earlier that uh, about, you know, um, bec uh, becoming like a healthy community and all. I'm thinking of asking, will this particular pandemic be a wake up call for businesses and consumers on the value of resiliency, on the value of the SDGs that you've mentioned earlier and the value of data and any particular opportunities in, uh, that come um, with this like changes that we experienced during the pandemic um, perhaps um, Kelum can start then engineer Iglesia then Jong Sung. Thank you. It's a very very hard question um, so I think there's a few different elements um, I think the the pace the, the occurrence of digital transformation has been a broad positive you know many governments many cities have done things that they would never have done before because of, of, of a kind of real need to do it um, there was no way that many can sustain that pace because of the sheer resource required but hopefully they will kind of sustain that direction although we are seeing some cities in some countries kind of going back to older ways of working which is a bit concerning um, the second on a kind of citizen level Chris as you mentioned is also the importance of behavior change um, and Dr. Uh, Yong Sung mentioned this earlier, uh, behavior change can be a hugely time intensive process. So the impact can be you know, potentially even generational. So measuring that, attributing it can be quite hard, but we need to be trying to do so if possible. Um, and then the, the third element, um, I think is very much about ensuring that we design things uh, well and we design them sustainably. Um, and this is coming back to what we talked about earlier around the importance of digital foundations. And also a point that Dr. Jong uh, Sun just mentioned. Um, often when we talk about digital, um, we highlight that it saves money, but most of the time it requires a huge upfront investment in the kind of back end or back office solutions that, that Dr. Jong 
uh, some just mentioned. Um, and then those investments only become apparent in what is hopefully a once in a generation pandemic. So for example, Singapore, where we're based, um, started its smart nation journey in 2013, in 2014. Um, and what, six, seven years later, those foundations have proven incredibly valuable in responding to the pandemic. So it's almost also taking kind of longer term perspective to how we approach digital transformation, but also resilience as well. That this is not a investment or something that will uh, make a, a return in days or weeks. It could even be years or decades. Thank you for that, uh, Kalum. Um, Engineer Glasha? Uh, definitely, Chris, it's a wake up call for both the businesses and consumers. And uh, this pandemic really brought us some challenges that has never been experienced before by communities. And, uh, but these challenges uh, also open opportunities for improvement. More often, uh, the best innovations comes out of necessity. And with the emerging advancement in technology, I firmly believe that uh, businesses will put more premium on research and development and explore the shift to full-time shift to online platforms for all the transactions in businesses and other establishments, uh, particularly here in our country, the Philippines. Thank you. Thank you, Engineer Iglesia. Uh, Jongsung, any particular take? Uh, yes, uh, so I have to say COVID-19 uh, brought so bad things, most bad things, but uh, well, we can also find some uh, some good uh, some good impact. So I guess, uh, especially in Korea, uh, it contributed to changing mind mindset mindset of Korean people. So um, so uh, it seems to me, this is personal uh, personal opinion that Korean people is interesting. So they are very key in changing their uh, so adapting to so uh, new innovation. But on the other hand, at the same time, they are very uh, Korean. Uh, is uh, Korean are very conservative, so we don't change. So, for instance, in Korea, telemedicine is still illegal. Also, uh, many other many innovative services are uh, illegal in Korea, and also we don't use so uh, working from home. We don't use working from home. We think uh, uh, that's not a good way of uh, working. So, uh, so so most people so uh, go to the office, but uh, COVID-19 uh, gradually, I think, uh, so gradually changed the mindset of uh, Korean, Korean people. Uh, and also if we utilize this change well, then we can uh, speed up the, so how to say, uh, innovation, national innovation, uh, so, more, uh, so how to faster, <laughs> more quickly. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jong Sung. Thank you, Callum and Engineer Iglesia. On that positive note, I'm quite, you know, like sensitive in terms of our like time here. Um, perhaps we can move um move on to our next like um uh particular like section wherein all panelists will be given like around like 30 seconds low so crunch time in terms of giving like giving us like one statement, one particular statement on what will be a data driven. Uh, resilient community for each, um, each every one of you. So perhaps uh, Callum would start first. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, so for me, a, a data-driven uh, community is one that is inclusive and no one is left behind from the resilience efforts. So using data, other tools, other methods to make sure we're delivering the best services and the best policies to make sure we're protecting everyone's lives and livelihoods as well. Thank you for that. Uh, Johnson? I think data driven enable us to apply uh, software software type of uh, responses. So how so a city apply mostly hardware, hardware type response to uh, open problem and uh, crisis, but uh, data driven approach enable us to uh, software style so we can uh, not just uh, not changing hardware itself but we can uh, change the software and then uh, resp response response more quickly to any crisis so I think data driven and uh, enable us a software software style, uh, type of response yeah thank you 
Thank you. Engineer Iglesias? Yes, uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, this is addressed to our policymakers, and uh, I think that uh, a fact-based decision-making for community development and disaster proofing is uh, uh, a necessity. Thank you. Chris, you're on mute. About that? Sorry about that. Okay, so in closing, I really appreciate every panelist for sharing your experiences and, of course, expertise. If I would like, you know, to close with my own wish for a data-driven, resilient community, I really want a sharing community which leverages on open data and citizen engagement to bounce back and to become future-proof from any disasters and any challenges. So on that note, I will hand it over to, to Davor. Thank you, everyone.